Hi everyone. In the previous lecture on this course on radio frequency system design, we were discussing about the history of radio or wireless communications. I will now start from where we left off in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we we traversed through time and reached in the mid 1800s. And in the mid 1800s, we saw that a few creative minds realized that if we can convert messages into electrical signals and they knew electrical signals will tra travel much at much faster speeds then communication can also take place at take place at much higher speeds so then naturally uh, in fact just to quickly uh, give 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 some idea about telegraphy so telegraphy had now become a reality by mid 1800s and there were um, uh, engineers and workmen who were who were employed to create messages so they they used to have these code words ready in their minds and they would quickly translate messages into morse codes and at the receiving end there will be interpreters or decoders who would quickly decode the message and deliver the message to the intended person to the intended receivers now the next question is what next is there something that can be done beyond this now by then it became very clear that if we can convert messages to electrical signals then transmission can be made very fast so then why to actually convert text to message but rather can't voice itself be converted into electrical signals so that was the thought process and that eventually led to the invention of telephony so one of the things i mean now we know microphone most of them contain a piezoelectric uh, a piezoelectric material which would contain which would translate it's a transducer which converts speech signals to electrical signals but back then for to think of it for the first time was a big revolution now alexander graham bell famously demonstrated the invention of a telephone by using this at that time it was called as a transmitter and uh, the converter the transducer the microphone was called as a transmitter so he, that was the first time he could convert speech signals to electrical signals and convey the message to a person uh, through wires to a person far away from from the given location in fact he performed this in an, in an expo and uh, instantly became an overnight celebrity and uh, and of course he built the eventually built a company which would go on to become AT&T Bell Labs in fact the invention of telephone at least the first micro uh, microphone uh, using the word for for a lack of a better word at that time was often attributed or rather it's an anecdotal evidence it's attributed to a, a scientist from brazil as well who used to experiment by giving shock treatments to his wife on this uh, on this uh, uh, microphone kind of a device and he did invent it but it turns out his wife was angered by his shocks um and eventually she sold it to someone else and eventually it was lost in time but whatever it is in the documented history the credit for uh, telephone is given to alexander graham bell now this was in the mid to late 1800s a lot of inventions were also going uh, taking place simultaneously now you have to keep in mind even though telephony is now be i mean it was it was by now demonstrated it took a few decades many decades in early 1900s for long distance telephony and to also have a stable telephone connection a reality it took a few decades after that in fact we will see in at a later stage it was telephone uh, which was it, it it was another big invention which was necessary to make telephony a reality a long distance telephony a reality now coming back to this 1800s the um, around mid 1800s around 1860s maxwell wrote his proper theory of electromagnetism and also he predicted the existence of waves which will travel at the speed of light so if you if you can generate a time varying electric field uh, then it can up with, with an appropriate arrangement it can generate a time varying magnetic field and that will turn in turn generate an electric field and that can travel in space at the speed of light now that was just a mathematical theory it was properly properly proved the existence of it was properly proved by a german ph physicist named heinrich hertz in fact a few other scientists around the same time did experiment on it but the documented history points to heinrich hertz discovery of electromagnetic waves now what heinrich hertz did was a simple setup 
he built a, a loop in fact he had a spark gap arrangement so there will be a tiny spark created between two spheres when there is a current in the loop there will be a sudden spark so you know that a, a current is present in the loop all he had to do was to create a time varying current or or create a time varying current or a time varying fields in one loop and if he can generate a time varying current in another loop however small be the magnitude then which which is kept far away from this uh, from the main apparatus then he has in theory proved the existence of electromagnetic waves so in fact if you see most antennas which contain a transmitter and receiver you can visualize the transmitter and receiver a transmitter and the receiver as primary and secondary of a transformer where you induce current in where you inject the excite one end of the transformer and by a long induction um, current gets induced at the receiving antenna of course the uh, coupling and all that will be much smaller because the distance is going to be much larger now he was able to prove that this would indeed induce current in a loop which was kept farther away in distance from the main loop from the from the primary coils and how he saw that again he had a small spark gap and he would notice small sparks that would indicate that there is current set in the secondary loop and thus proving the existence of electromagnetic waves now Uh, there are other accounts um, about this existence of electromagnetic waves in india in the, in the british raj at that time india was ruled by the british there was other indian physicist um, uh, or rather polymath by the name jc bose in fact uh, often the name bose is is confusing so we had two boses at that time one is jc bose the other one is satya and bose jc bose was the polymath he was an engineer is an innovator he was a polymath whereas satya and bose was a theoretical physicist to whom we give the credit for the bose bose einstein uh, bose einstein statistics and also the particle bosons is named after him now jc bose is the one who who actually with with his limited means in calcutta he managed to perform an experiment and demonstrate the existence of uh, this this uh, electromagnetic waves but he was not interested in making a product out of it but this was something that he could accomplish with very minimal means in india in calcutta and he called it the adrishya alok it means the invisible light now around this time by now by late 1800s we knew electromagnetic waves existed we knew or, or we knew how to convert messages or we had morse code which will convert messages to dots and dashes and transmit them as electrical signals we also had transmitters uh, which were the earliest microphones uh, which enabled uh, which enabled telephony wherein we could transmit speech signals directly or elect- uh, as electrical signals now the next question is what after this now the moment we were able to realize that we can transmit waves electro uh, we can transmit uh, uh, electro uh, electromagnetic waves did, uh, did exist then the natural the next question or the next obvious point is to see if we can transmit information as electromagnetic waves and that process led uh, a young in fact young italian physicist uh, italian innovator um by the name marconi to think of this idea of transmitting the morse code the message as telegraph signals wirelessly in, in fact he demonstrated the first practical um, tele- wireless telegraphy over the english channel but a lot of physicists when he showed this uh, in fact he presented this inside a box the, the device the apparatus he had and when a lot of physicists when he opened the box and a lot of physicists saw that they realized i mean uh, there was no new scientific invention he just put together the existing ideas and built this device whatever it is uh, eventually he won a nobel prize in late ni- i mean in 1909 for his invention on the wireless transmission of signals now this was early 1900s and towards the end of 1800s by now you should also keep in mind electricity had also fully evolved uh, the the wars the great wars the current wars between edison westinghouse edison on one side and westinghouse and tesla on the other side had already taken place um, the chicago fair um, uh, uh, the world fair then in chicago which took place in the late 1800s had already taken place ac had already won the war and now electrical ac transmission was also quite popular uh, 
So the streets of the, uh, the advan- I mean, like city of New York used to have the telegraphy lines, telephone lines, and the power lines all together in the, in in a, and it was a huge mess in the streets. Now also, wireless telegraphy was also shown to be a, a viable idea. Now we will uh, we will come back to uh, rather this uh, wireless telegraphy and Marcon in a, in a few moments, but. The, I'm just trying to summarize all the ideas that were there around late 1800s, the engineering ideas. There was electricity, there was uh, telephony, still for short distances, it was still, uh, it was it was a working solution. Telegraphy and Marconi showed wireless telegraphy. And in fact, he will go on to found a company, um, Marconi's company on wireless telegraphs and uh, that would become quite successful. But then, this the real invention which which ushered, which ushered us into this new era of communications is something that, uh, that interestingly uh, married the ideas of electromagnetics and information in a far better way than wireless telegraphy. And that is the radio. In fact, when radio was first invented, uh, many of them did not see this as a form of entertainment. In fact, uh, it was often joked as what would one do with a furniture that talks? Nobody would want a furniture that talks. But it was this radio which had completely brought us into this new age of wireless communications. So the story of radio is one of the most interesting stories. It involved three men whose contributions indirectly or directly uh, led us into this new age of the radio communications. So I'm just using the word not to injure anyone's sentiments if you like any of the scientists, but I'm just using the word purely because of their roles in the history. I've used quack, the quack, the shark and the genius. It was these three men and their obsession to in their own uh, pursuits in their lives, which eventually pushed us into this new age of wireless, the wireless radios. Now, coming back to Marconi, Marconi had now demonstrated the existence of uh, wireless tele- uh, uh, electromagnetic waves across the English Channel and he, he had now shown wireless telegraphy as a viable solution and he built a company and towards the, uh, and he had now uh, built a successful company and made money out of it. And in fact, he made a famous quote saying that, what have I done? Have I done the world good or have I added a new menace to the world? But now telegraphy was succeeding as a business and uh, then we will now come back to the story of radio. Now before we go to the story of radio, I forgot to mention one interesting point that's the sinking of the ship Titanic. The Titanic, uh, in fact the engineer of the Titanic famously said even God himself cannot uh, sink it. Unfortunately, it collides with an iceberg and uh, sinks in the middle of the Atlantic. Now, this Titanic was one of the state-of-the-art ships which had this uh, Marconi's wireless telegraphy installed on it. In fact, whatever lives that could be saved in the ship was, was saved because they could transmit the SOS signals from the center of the ocean to the shore uh, wirelessly. And in fact, whatever lives that uh, most of the credit, uh, some of the, uh, I've read some books around that time, which which often cite that whatever lives that were saved around that time were thanks to Marconi's uh, telegraphy invention. Now, uh, we'll come back to this important characters in the story of radio. The first one there is uh, David Sornoff. Now, this was the time in late early 1900s to late 1800s. America was going through a huge industrial revolution. In fact, the entrepreneurial way of, uh, I mean, the innovation wherein a uh, uh, scientist had an idea and then you see uh, he had a vision, he or she, they had a vision, vision to see a product in it. And then they made a product and if the product succeeded, they mass produced it and they become rich and, and they became rich. So this, uh, uh, there was a new wave of capitalism which was sweeping across uh, America and naturally, that was the place most of the most of the population immigrated to for uh, better economic for for better for to have a better economic life okay for for economic reasons they would immigrate to uh, united states one such immigrant from russia was david sarnoff now he had a dickensian uh, life 
um, of poverty. He lived on. He lived and slept on the streets. He used to read from the news, read newspapers thrown in the dustbins and learn English from it. And then he joined us uh, a telegraph operator. So in those days, telegraphy was a very popular. Uh, as we saw, Marconi's telegraphy company was a huge thing. So you either work for Edison or or uh, Edison. By then, it had become General General Electric, and uh, uh, you either work for that or or before that there was Edison Electric. or you work for the telegraph companies as a telegraph operator where you have to quickly translate the messages using this telegraphy device so he was working and taking up all those odd jobs and he joined marconi's company and then he moved his way upwards in this company now sarnoff saw a very interesting potential for radio even though it was an idea he saw that it can be a a, a great potential for a, for a, for a great product Marconi did not see have, have a similar vision he was more focused on telegraphy telegraphy was generally the messages were intended from one person to the other person so it was a point to point um, communication whereas radio was the first true blue uh, broadcast system where there was one user and many receive one transmitter and many intended receivers so sarnoff saw this potential of a huge product in radio a huge business in radio now around the same time there was another scientist uh, or rather uh, another young scientist uh, young and upcoming scientist by the name lee de forest now he was interested in the idea of being a genius so he was always interested in building things and showing to the society that he was indeed a, a, a great mind now as he was actually moving up, moving up his career and in one such incident uh, a professor who had hired him Uh, in 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 the university when he was setting up presenting a lecture and uh, de forest was performing an experiment and he accidentally blew up the electricity in in the entire building and eventually the professor fired him now uh de forest was an engineer he, his goal was always to patent it at least this is what i gathered from the recorded history um, by reading some interesting books and the history of transistors he was always interested in uh he interested in patenting not the scientific process itself the thought process and ideating and all of that but rather he was more mostly focused on the end goal or rather to produce an idea to produce a patent that was always his goal so and he would make some modifications make some tweaks and always patent it one such patent which he, which he he made an accidentally introduced a third terminal in a device by then called a vacuum tube diode he accidentally or rather he invented Uh, I shouldn't have used the word accidentally, but he invented an amplifier. So this was the first vacuum tube amplifier. So if you have seen uh, our, my previous lectures on uh, the, uh, amplifiers, I probably would have discussed on the history of amplifiers. Now a vacuum tube amplifier works on on a very simple principle. So you have a grid terminal which controls the flow of electrons between the anode and cathode terminals. Now by introducing this. he actually invented an amplifier now amplifier was a much needed device at that time to make radios a reality you needed a compact device which can amplify weak signal so any signal whether it an analog signal especially for radio to become a reality and for long distance telephone telephony to become a reality you needed amplifiers they had to amplify weak signals and generate much stronger signals out of this weak signal and if amplifiers are possible then long distance telephony becomes possible and also radio communications becomes much more simpler so uh, de forest's invention was one of the milestones in the evolution of radio communications now even though he invented it he never fully understood its operation neither he built a successful amplifying circuit uh, using his invention but he just patented it and for and he he uh, he added a third wall and uh, he called it the triode now to put this amplifier to good use another great mind comes into the picture now edwin armstrong was a young young and upcoming scientist himself who had great aspirations to become a scientist he loved heights and uh, uh, he he would often hoist himself uh, up A long, a long poles, and often view view the world from the top. 
and he was a an acrophilic uh, uh, he was an acrophilic and i just called him an i'm uh, just calling him an acrophilic genius and he he would he had this natural or uh, the gift of a of a tinkerer and a, and a brilliant thinker since child uh, since since a much younger age at least whatever i've read about him uh, in his younger years now when he was an undergraduate at uh, columbia university at that point uh, he came up with this very interesting idea of a super regenerative circuit at that time if you want to get high amplification you needed a cascade of amplifiers but instead he came up with an arrangement using a single amplifier and using some kind of feedback feed this output back to the input with some arrangement he could get a very high gain to to, to just illustrate it if a system is positively fed back the loop gain is given by a by the closed loop gain is given by a by 1 minus a beta now if you ensure your a beta is very close to 1 then this this factor will become much greater than a so where a here is the gain of a single amplifier now let's assume a beta is 0.99 then a by 1 by a beta will become 100a so using one amplifier and some kind of a feedback arrangement i could get much higher gains and this amplifier was called the super regenerator because it, it it since you are feeding the output back to the input and amplifying the signal again and again it was called the super regenerative circuit or a regenerative amplifier now it was a brilliant idea at that point he built a circuit but it eventually did not take off one of the reasons was that as as most of us engineers would have built negative amplifier circuits you would know that if your loop gain is very close to 1 and it's it's very close to instability so most of these amplifier super regenerative circuits instead of behaving as amplifiers they would behave they would start oscillating okay in fact this this behavior which engineers observed would become a will become a very important testing criterion for amplifiers they realized if you can build an amplifier you can also build an oscillator so i i had already described in the story of the point contact transistors when the first transistors when were invented 3 decades later in 1940s uh, at bell labs the scientists they said they had a transistor in their hands the upper management simply asked them to show them if they can build an oscillator using that and they did and that's how they proved the existence of uh, they showed that they had a new device uh, which can a new amplifying device so here coming back to the story edwin armstrong demonstrated uh, he can build a super regenerative circuit and he displayed his his, his skills at, at a very young age now david sornoff had by now ascended this ascended towards this uh, this this throne of uh, the radio empire he was moving upwards in his career now he was in a very powerful position the marconi's company and uh, uh, here uh, he was also uh, he immediately saw the young talent in armstrong and hired him into his company now they had nbc which will later go on to uh, have rci as well so he was a part of that company and uh, i armstrong was hired into Uh, was hired under Sornoff to work for him as an engineer on the new emerging field of radios. We will later see in the story that they will become bitter enemies towards the end of Armstrong's life. Now, around the same time, after the success of the amplifying device by Edwin Armstrong, um, De Forest files a lawsuit against him, claiming that it was his invention um, that. he had uh, copied his invention of uh, uh, he claimed super regenerative amplifier itself as his invention the the point to be understood here is that edwin armstrong wrote seminal papers describing the functionality of a super regenerative circuit and also the the triode amplifier for engineers so at that time there was the ire uh, institute of radio engineers was the journal for radio engineers and in that he published his uh, very uh, seminal works on the working of the triode um and also the uh, the super regenerative circuits in clear terms whereas de forest when he was asked to explain his own invention he struggled to explain it at a much later point in his in, in his life but whatever it is he filed a lawsuit against him but then as this uh, as armstrong was facing the heat of this suddenly the world was now drawn by much forces which were much bigger at uh, much bigger than uh, these inventions world war 1 had was was now about to take place 
Now, as soon as World War began, there's a very interesting saying, at the times of peace, a scientist belongs to the world. At the times of war, a scientist belongs to the nation. Edwin Armstrong enlisted himself in the war and he gave all his patents free to the to free of cost or he made all his patents available to the government and for the war work now during this war he made another interesting invention called the super heterodyne principle or the super heterodyne receivers so generally most uh, uh, radios or narrow band radio signals are narrow band signals so the receivers have to filter those signals uh, before they are down converted but those filters had to have for them to have that narrowness they needed to have much higher q because their center frequency was very high now super heterodyne is a principle which just reduces the center frequency now when you reduce the center frequency we will discuss this in greater technical detail at a later point in the course but right now just to give a, a rough idea qualitatively uh, we can see that if you reduce the center frequency then to get the same bandwidth filter bandwidth you will need a much lower q than what you would have needed at a higher frequency and he quickly realized this and he thought of this interesting idea called super heterodyne principle which is which 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 is an idea that lives even today more than 100 years since um its invention now once the war was over he was back to this legal troubles and unfortunately he lost his legal battle with uh, de forest and uh, he lost the claim for the super heterodyne circuit but this angered the engineering community and when he was given a medal he refused to take the medal because he was angry that uh, uh, he 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 lost the case against uh, the uh, de forest and uh, the engineering community gave him a standing ovation for his contributions to radio communications at that time now back to radios i haven't really spoken about how radio communication was made possible so uh, by now uh, we understood that electromagnetic waves existed but if you can convert messages into electromagnetic signals then we can transmit them over long distances now that idea that you can superimpose message signals on a high frequency signal was was something that was accidentally discovered on power lines so there's they had some while in playing closer to a power lines and at some other location they could hear this music and that's how it was an accidental invention that you can actually superimpose message signals onto a high frequency carrier and transmit them and receive them reliably so that uh, uh, when you can how, how do we modulate a carrier we can either modulate its amplitude or its frequency by then engineers at bell labs uh, at least there were a lot of scientists some uh, famously like, uh, someone like carson they had uh, by now used the theories of fourier and laplace now they were being put to good use so carson had worked as extensively and shown that amplitude modulation uh, the bandwidth of the transmitted signal is same as the bandwidth of the message signal and fm requires much higher bandwidth and hence it's not really a good uh, uh, good mode good way of modulating so am was the de facto choice for modulation in the earlier radio communications AM radios came with a major problem of static noise. If the bandwidth of the message signal increased, then you then ended up accumulating more noise because if you assume a white noise, it's just that you integrate more white noise. So noise will also increase. So AM came with this problem of uh, static noise. And Edwin Armstrong hated this static noise. In fact, when he purchased his first car, most of those cars in those days came with uh in am radios and he since he didn't like the static noise he he purchased a car without the am radio now uh, this is the point I, i'm just trying to quote a very interesting quote by uh, uh, by david sornoff that he was a cutthroat businessman and he would go any extent to succeed in the business so he is fa- there are many famous quotes attributed to him one among them is the thrill uh, believe me is as much in the battle as it's in the victory and also there is other quote his where he says that uh, i don't get ulcers because i give them to others uh, ulcers here is referring to the stress that he causes to the others to his competitors now here he has now he uh, david sornoff had finally reached the peak of his career so this is a picture of david sornoff taken with marconi both of them are immigrants 
both and he wanted to a picture with with a stick and styled very similarly to marconi this picture he is indirectly uh, rather the picture's message is to send to the world that he is now taking over the position that marconi once had now he has built a new radio empire and he was the emperor of this new world now the problem with am versus fm i have just uh, discussed a few moments ago that armstrong hated this static noise in am am radios and he want he started to work on eliminating it so what he saw was that when you build an fm radio uh, i'll probably talk about the technical details of fm reception then you will understand how at that time this was early 1900s fm was seen as a superior way of modulation what he showed was that if you transmit message signals using fm radio and you have an appropriate receiver a proper receiver built you can significantly reduce noise levels by some uh, i'm probably not going to the technical details now but very briefly to mention um, you have some kind of a frequency discriminator kind of a receiver which differentiates the noise signal and if you put a low pass filter and do some kind of a pre emphasis at the res- at the transmitter we can in theory reduce noise in fm signal significantly and he showed fm can completely eliminate the static a static uh, a problem that existed in am radio there was a constant buzzing noise that am radios generated which was completely absent the moment he switched on the fm radio and he again demonstrated this in a basement in at columbia university and he took this idea to uh, uh, to david sornoff now by then empire state building had just been constructed and uh, uh, the radio company which marconi's which which was now in the hands of sornoff had its had its division in in the empire state building and he was given a place uh, armstrong was given a place uh, at the empire state building uh, for performing these experiments on fm and am but by now uh, there was another new invention which was capturing the interest of 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 the businessmen and the venture capitalists at that time that is an invention radio offered sound but this invention added sight to that sound and that is the television now television completely changes the way entertainment is consumed in the next few decades but radio until now was still a dominant form of entertainment in most of the households in the next part of the story we will see what happens to um, the the war between um, armstrong and sornoff and how they will be from good friends how they'll eventually turn to bitter enemies i'll stop at this point thank you